Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to The Therapy Room, Behind Closed Doors, and this is episode 27. It feels like we've been doing these forever, Bob. (laughs) And in this episode, we're going to be looking at the importance of boundaries within the therapeutic relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's a good subject. I'm looking forward to this one. Okay, so do you want me to start some of my thoughts? Yes, as always. Lots of wisdom, Bob, please. Okay, so the way I see this is in many different facets, but let's start with boundaries and contracts. Yeah. In other words, boundaries within the therapeutic relationship are particularly linked to the contract that you have at the beginning of the therapy process. Yeah. So you've got many different types of boundaries. So, you know, like, you know, uh, how much you're going to pay for the service, how long it's going to be, um, the fact that it stops after one hour and you don't go past an hour. Um, but boundaries are really, if we think of it around contracts, is shaping the relationship between the therapist and the client. Yeah. And so on. And I think boundaries are so fundamentally important to provide a structure um, of the way forward in the therapeutic relationship. Yeah. It, it, see, I, there's, there's lots of different areas, I think, that boundaries come under. I, I don't know whether I'm going off track a bit here, but it, again, it links into trust and it's kind of like, um, I want to say a line in the sand that we don't go over. Yeah, that provide a structure. Yeah, yeah. A sense of the form of the relationship, what's acceptable, not, you know, and what isn't acceptable. So, you know. Because it is, it, it, as a therapist, it's about outside the therapy room as well as inside, I think. That's right. That's yeah. what I said. It's very much about the therapist with the client setting the boundaries, the structure, the formation of the therapy process and what is acceptable and what isn't accessible. So you can even say rules. I don't particularly like the word rules, but we might even use the word ethics. <clears throat> what's yes. ethical and what's not ethical? Yes, that's where my mind <clears throat> was going when you were talking about boundaries was ethics. That's the word I was looking for, Bob, yeah. Yeah, so there's a sense of accountability. Yes. And that it actually means that the client or the therapists don't get exploited. Yeah. Yeah. Because these boundaries have been spelled out and should be spelled out at the beginning of the therapeutic relationship, which is why it's linked to contracts. Yeah. And I, I think that as a therapist is is really important, you know, to, to work ethically within the therapy room. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so... did, did you see that program that was on um, a while back about um, people claiming to be able to cure certain things? No. It's it's really interesting. It's like you'll be able to watch it on catch up on iPlayer. It's about um, unregulated therapists, you know, claiming to cure anxiety in under an hour and charging an astronomical amount of money for it with no qualifications yeah except i see that as very different from what we're talking about okay i think i know where you're going which is ethical around ethics so if it was a podcast on ethics then i can see where you're really going if we've got a podcast on boundaries i think boundaries is there's of course got ethics there but it's linked to the contract so in other words you know therapists should and many TA therapists do have a contracts which are signed. Yeah. And those boundaries are 
written down, and if it's not written down one, it's verbally stated. Mm. So, for example, what you brought up, which is that the therapist sees the client in the venue, wherever their office is, for 50 minutes or an hour every week at the same time, and that they, though they might be friendly towards their clients, this is not about being friends to the clients. This is a yeah. professional relationship. So yeah. we are heading towards the area of ethics. Yes, I can see where you're going with that. And I think boundaries are linked to the contract. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, because then it, it's written down and it can be referred back to. And I, I know we spoke earlier on in these podcast episodes about the things that we've got in contract about you know, not coming under the influence of drugs or alcohol and, you know, not being physical and all those sort of things. Yeah. They're all boundaries, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And they are in my contract and it is signed, even yeah. though it's yeah. digitally signed now because I'm not seeing clients face to face, but yeah. Yeah. So then the question is who responsibility, responsibility is it to set the boundaries in a therapeutic relationship? And my response to that is it's the therapists. Yes. Yeah. Now they may do it with the client. However, they set the boundaries and it provides a structure for the clients. It also reduces anxiety for the clients. Yeah. And the therapist, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Because both parties know where they start and where they begin. Yeah. And I, th I think one of the things that I kind of, I don't want to say I struggled with that that I was glad of boundaries and ethics and things was um, clients attempting to contact me outside of the session. Yeah, so as uh, we said in the first podcast or podcast on contracts, that one of the, I assume, I can't remember that podcast, but I assume one of your boundaries, which is probably written into the contract, is uh, that they can't do that. Yeah. Or you might have written down something like, and some therapists do, might have written down something, well, in case of emergency, I don't know what your contract is, but it's a boundary. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think mine says that the only contact, you know, outside of the, the session mm. is to rearrange or cancel the session and, you know, the telephone calls or whatever can be made, but obviously they need to be booked in. It's it's a booked in thing as opposed to mm. randomly phoning me up if that makes sense yeah so but yeah it, it does it does keep you you know myself safe and the client safe yeah so i think these boundaries here are pretty standard i think that probably the people in these podcasts would understand contracts and boundaries however if we move to a more subtle part of boundaries which i'd quite like to move to um, which is, you know, the clients and you will have, I assume, because you've worked quite a long time, uh, have many therapists who actually may not really understand the term boundaries. In other words, their model of boundaries may have been from a dysfunctional system, mm. where the boundaries were set very loosely, vaguely, or very strictly. Either way, their concept of boundaries is probably being or might have been quite unhealthy. And that, in fact, might have been why they've come to therapy. Yeah. You know, in other words, in relationship with part, romantic partners or even other types of relationships with friendships or business parties, they, they, they're they unable to keep boundaries or they see boundaries in a sort of merging capacity rather than what's acceptable and what's not acceptable or people who might have the problems in saying no and just somebody else's sense of boundaries and they then end up maybe in a codependent relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I, when, well, as you were talking then, I, I automatically went to, you know, somebody that has a people-pleasing <clears throat> personality driver that, yeah, it's it's really easy for for in the session for the client to be people pleasing as opposed to, you know, sticking to the rules or or things. Yeah. So, if we look at some of the problems around boundaries, one of them will be 
uh, might be a sense of codependency or a lack of what we call interdependency, where both parties are responsible uh, for keeping these boundaries. So it will depend again on the history of your client. Yeah. So if they've been in a situation where let's 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 look at what they are they're, they're you know they've perhaps been born to a situation where their parents split up when they were say had a client a day at eight. Yeah. So the mother remarries or has a new boyfriend. And the mother has one set of boundaries and the new boyfriend has another set of boundaries. So for the new boyfriend, it doesn't really matter what time the person goes to bed, the child goes to bed, or the other person, they're very strict on what is in this. So the person gets mixed messages around boundaries. Yeah. So when they grow up, they have confusion over boundary setting, for example. Yeah. So as a therapist, one of the jobs you'll be doing is helping the person have a more sense of clarity, confusion and predictability about what, what they want in terms of setting limits and boundaries in a healthy way. Might be something a therapist would have as a contract to look at. Yeah. Yeah, because again, you know, I know you've said it in the past and, you know, I 100% agree with it. it. It's about bringing our past into the the present and how that will play out in a relationship if, you know, they, they're unclear about what boundaries are. Oh. I've had clients in the past that parents kind of had no boundaries or very strange boundaries. I can't hear you. I'm sorry, I was saying that I've had clients in the past that either their parents had no boundaries, so there wasn't any rules. It was kind of a free for all. But then they would make up a rule randomly that made no sense. Yeah. So what happens is the client ends up getting confused. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the jobs of the therapist. It's not talked about enough in terms of boundaries, as far as I'm concerned is to provide a healthy model around boundaries. Yeah. Would that come under the heading of reparenting? Oh, it depends what you call reparenting, doesn't it? You know, it's like, um, it's a very big word, isn't it? Um, and some people listening to this might think of it in cult terms. So, um, you know, it's like a continuum, a mentoring, parenting is that reparenting it's another podcast really but in terms of um in terms of actually having a model of healthy mentoring or healthy you might want to call it parenting if the if the uh, earlier history was unhealthy um but it's more like spot reparenting for me okay it's not really like a full-blown reparenting is it no, no, but it, it's again, like you say, it's modeling healthy boundaries and you, you know, how, how we do that on a daily basis. So I see when I said reparenting, it's kind of like that we model the boundaries and not let the client push the boundaries. Yeah. That we need to be quite potent in getting the agreement to the boundary in the first place and us not being lapsidaisical with them and modeling that in the therapy room. Yeah, and, and in transaction analysis language, and forgive me for people listening to this down no TA, but I think those boundaries need to be made bilaterally from an adult to adult place, yeah. rather than just happening from a parent child place. But sometimes do we need to buy into that? For the therapeutic relationship what do you mean by that jackie well if we're looking at reparenting and you know if, if the model of boundaries say for for example weren't that strong that we need to be potent enough to stick to that yeah i agree i'm okay you're okay an adult to adult but if then the client pushes the boundaries is is that does that not come under the terms of reparenting you see, modeling. I, I think reparenting is an evocative term and I, it would mean what you mean by reparenting. 
You see, for me, I think these boundaries, contracts, etc., need to come from an adult to adult place, not a parent child place where the therapist defines the boundaries and um, doesn't allow any opportunity for discussion, uh, for example. So if you make the boundaries in a bilateral adult to adult way, almost before therapy starts, or, yeah. as, or as you go on in the therapeutic relationship, uh, so there's an adult uh, agreement, whether after that it might move to transference or whatever you like, but at least there's a sense of empowerment and autonomy in the boundary settings rather than a, what can be seen as a defined uh, position by the therapist. Yeah. I yeah, no, I understand what you mean, but the contract in itself is kind of, is that up for discussion? Yes, all the way through, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Because otherwise, you, you it's the opposite of empowerment and autonomy, isn't it? In the therapy room, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I was thinking, that, you know, the contract that I've got written, I'm not sure whether the things I've got on it would be open for discussion. Well, it depends how you see contracts again. I mean, it'd be good for people to listen to when we talk about pod but there's different types of contracts. Yeah. There's an overall contract at the beginning. Yes. But as you go along, there's process agreements. Yeah. Now, in the process agreements and the process contracts as you go along, that is the time, surely, from an adult to adult place that you might negotiate boundaries. Yeah, yeah. Rather than, which I think you might have been, you know, when you talk about reparenting, which I have my own um, bias against, you might have reparenting where there isn't a encouragement on negotiation, negotiation, empowerment and autonomy. Yeah, I can just remember in supervision early on in, in my career that, you know, I had this discussion with my supervisor about um, feeling like I was parenting and you know it was said to me that that's okay it's okay for you to do that and then we model um individuation and separation and how that's done appropriately within yeah. the therapy settings well well different therapists and supervisors have different views on things yeah and i think the word parenting is one to the people often have different views on so yeah. For example, is a teacher parenting? Is a man mentor, mentor parenting? So what I'm trying to say is that I'd rather have an adult to adult discussion about boundaries rather than one that is defined by the parent. Mm. Yeah. Now, interesting enough, in some therapeutic and counseling circles, parenting would be seen as not okay because it because it could be seen as an abuse of power if it's discussed from an i'm okay you're okay adult to adult position i think we've got a different process going on now that doesn't mean that transferentially the client might not project onto the therapist an idolized parent that they never had. Yeah, that doesn't mean that, that that doesn't happen. I'm sure it does happen a lot. And maybe even that we could argue that that is one of the goals of therapy, by the way. However, it doesn't mean that we don't negotiate from adult to adult frameworks around boundary setting. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the, the boundary setting, you know, can be used in in that, you know, I, if you don't like the reparenting, but the, the modelling of appropriate relationships, that the, mm. the boundaries are used within that in the therapy room. I think I prefer, Jackie, this term spot reparenting. Yeah. Myself. Where there may be, in that particular instance, a modelling which resembles a health, healthy parenting, but it is not like a overall reparenting sequence where the person client goes back to different developmental stages 
and replace parental um, processes. Yeah, yeah. And I, I get what you're saying. It, that's because that's one school of transactional analysis, isn't it? And that's that's not what I was meaning. It's more, yeah. When when a, a client goes into that vulnerable place and feels unsafe, then I do see that part of my role is to hold them in that safe space, as whether you call it a mentor, as in a parent figure, as in I don't see that as abusing no because that's more spot right yeah yeah because otherwise if you did let's just put it another way around yes i agree with you in terms of spot reparenting or momentary parenting or uh, healthy modeling yes but if you did that all the time yeah that would lead i believe or could lead to infantilization and therefore, yeah. the opposite, what I believe therapy is about, which is autonomy and empowerment. Yeah. Yeah. If you did that all the time, Jackie, and came from a parent position all the time in the service of what we might call reparenting, that is one style of therapy. And, and you, could, you could even argue that you would be setting boundaries from a different place than the original parent was, XXX. However, if you do it all the time, I think you have a different therapeutic contract. You might as well call it a reparenting contract from the beginning. Yeah. But what you're talking about, I think, is that in, within the therapeutic process, you may sometimes model a healthy parental experience, which they never got. Well, I hope that's what I do. That's what I think. <laughs> talking about what yeah. you're not talking about though is doing that session after session after oh. session after session without an agreement yeah no 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 and i wouldn't feel comfortable even if there was an agreement to do that ongoing in a therapy situation yeah so if we go back to boundaries a moment so you're i hear what you're saying that you would do that from a place of um what was a deficit perhaps for the uh, the client and then through the modeling from your uh parenting process which you're talking about they start to integrate more healthy boundaries and start to uh, understand what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and what to negotiate and what not to negotiate and what's safe and what's not safe yeah 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 i think that's part of a duty of a therapist in a way it's when it, the problem is it's when the therapist steps into the process in a more generalized manner and starts to define reality for the client. Yeah, I, I think I, I was getting mixed up with what you were saying. I think I was thinking more of the end result and the modeling of, you know, separating out if, if the client does become dependent on the therapist and use the therapist as their only safe space and all those sort of things to model this, you know, the individuation and separating out in a healthy way that, you know, you're not abandoned, we're not going to leave you, this, this is not replaying history, we can do it a different way. Yeah, I, 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 I get that. Yeah. And if we're talking about boundaries again, um, one of the most common breaches of boundaries is what I would call um, or may call a codependent action. In other words, when the, the therapist's sense of self and the client's sense of self get merged. Yeah. So both parties lose each other. So the boundary between, boundary of self-identity between the client and the therapist gets lost. The boundaries blurred. Yes. So for example, you know, they start um, perhaps be, you know, friends outside the therapy room. Yeah, which goes back to what I was saying earlier on about, you know, making connections outside of the therapy room and, and things like that, yeah. You know, your sound is keeping is often going momentarily. Do you know that? In this podcast, 
you yeah. go smaller for a couple of seconds and come back again. And I was wondering if it's because you're not near the microphone or something. Yeah, no, it's not moving. I don't know. Just thought I'd say that for the people listening. Okay. Well, I apologise <laughs> if that's happening. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just to tell you that. Um, but I'm sure you can catch up with this. So, yes, yeah, so boundaries are very important in terms of self-identity between client and therapist. And what can happen often is the therapists get merged somehow with the client. And that's often because the client is um, coming from a very needy place and projects it onto the therapist. And the therapist buys into it somehow, perhaps from a rescuing place, for example. Yeah. But they end up losing their sense of self, both of them. And you get a codependent relationship. So, for example, instead of stopping at one hour, it goes on to two minutes past the hour. And yeah. the next session, it ends up at five minutes past the hour. And then all of a sudden, this is 15 minutes past the hour because the two people have lost their own senses of self-identity in that process. One a rescuer and the other one is more, well, in TA terms, you might call it victim, but it's projecting their needy, vulnerable self. You've been the listening to The Therapy the Show, into it, I Behind think Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Sort of Don't forget to subscribe client. and leave us a review. We'll be back next week exactly. with another episode. Yeah, and, and a definite blurring of the boundaries. And yeah. It, it, I, I can remember in my early days of, of seeing clients, it was really uncomfortable for me at times to stick to the time, particularly if they, they, you know, they do the age-old thing where they drop a a bombshell five minutes before the end of the session to actually leave that and not pick it up necessarily mm-hmm. and I think that comes with experience and having boundaries in place yeah so it's very important that the therapist sets boundaries uh, to minimize exploitation mm. for example um, and you are right the clients often, especially if you work transferentially, need to have a safe, secure uh, place where they can actually do the deep therapeutic work, which is often needed. And you'll only get that through safe boundaries. Yeah. For both parties. It's For both parties. Yeah. But it is the duty of the therapist to initiate the boundaries and maintain the boundaries, not the client often because the client has gone to a younger developmental level. Yeah. But it, 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 it's about us protecting ourselves as well as protecting the client in, oh, in that absolutely situation. Our, yeah. Absolutely. Our own well-being so that we can stop at one hour and go off and enjoy our evening and not stay there an hour and a half uh, and have a partner that's very fed up with you and you've missed your dinner. Yes. For example. That would be horrendous. Hmm. And so, <laughs> so, you know, some of these boundaries. And it's, it's not even that, you know, if you're working in, say, for example, Manchester Institute and you, you know, have a 50 minute session and you have 10 minutes where you can catch up on your notes and everything and kind of cut off from that one client and prepare for the next client, you've also got a responsibility to the client that, you've got coming up next to stick to the time so it's there's there's a lot of reasons why the boundaries are important yeah of course so i think again to repeat it's the therapist's duty to maintain the boundaries not the clients yeah and that's because clients often regress and go to a different developmental level um and it's very important the therapist sees it that way Yeah, it's it's very interesting stuff, and and like you said, on a psychological level, the stuff that's going on in the therapy room, it, it is yeah. Th- there's so many different levels. Hmm. So, for example, the question listeners might want to ask themselves is, how come clients will often, many many times push the boundaries with therapists 
Now that doesn't come from an adult place. It usually comes from a TA place, a younger developmental time where, of course, and you know this yourself, where the client isn't the age they are in the room, mm -hmm. 23, whatever it is. They might be, I don't know, might be 13. They could be three, they could be five. But that developmental age might be about pushing boundaries to um, have their own sense of empowerment and own sense of agency, which is very important that developmental level. And if that didn't happen, then what we said earlier on, it is the duty of the therapist, I think, to model that healthy boundary. Yeah. Now, of course, the more disturbed a client is, then the more emphasis, I believe, and the more uh, the therapist needs to be vigilant about the power plays by the disturbed client to push boundaries. Now we've talked about that, haven't we, in the borderline client? Yeah, yeah. Or the narcissistic client who believes they're in the centre of the world and their sense of entitlement is um, is you know the top. They're the top. Paramount, top. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think regardless of the ups and downs emotionally or whatever's going on, the therapist needs to be very consistent uh, with keep into those boundaries that have been set yeah yeah and I, I i have in the past you know if if i felt like the boundaries are being challenged or or the, the client is pushing them in the subsequent session spoke about it because i'm really conscious of not blaming and shaming you know, if, if a client's really wanting to prolong that session and I'm saying, you know, this is not happening, it's how that can be perceived by the client as well. Oh. So you, you would do see, that's what I'm talking about. And it's good to hear that you do it. Uh, you do process contracts from an adult place. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I would go back and, you know, have a discussion about how the last session ended maybe and bring that up yeah from an adult place it yes be from an yeah. adult place. that's what yeah. i'm saying and that's yeah. empowerment and autonomy isn't it yes yeah rather than infantilizing yeah yeah and i, I think you know i misunderstood what you were saying before when i was talking about reparenting and, and things like that but it is sometimes if you are with somebody who is pushing the boundaries that you need to be firm that those boundaries are there for a reason. It's not because I've decided to put them there. It's because it's to protect me and it's to protect the client and there's a yeah. reason for them. Yeah. In TA terms, that would have come from a healthy controlling parent position. Yeah. Not very needed. And with more disturbed clients, um very much the emphasis is needed from that position yeah and the therapists that bow in who cave in on that uh not only are seeding seeds of destruction for themselves but they're not helping the client at all no yeah and i, I think as well you know in in the early days that was difficult to see sometimes. No, they I were uh, sowing the seeds for something further down the line if you didn't stick to the boundaries that yeah. were agreed upon. Yeah. 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 It's very interesting, Bob. So, what we're going to do in the next podcast is the use of the self and self disclosure in the therapeutic relationship, which I guess kind of follows on a little bit from this. Yeah, it does the boundaries and how much do we share and how much do we not yeah absolutely yeah so we will we will be back next week with episode 28 good i look forward to that okay speak soon speak soon you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review We'll be back next week with another episode.